Hello Watch Enthusiasts and welcome to Watch Chronicler Podcast. In today's episode I'd like to speak about a theme which has been thrown around in some articles over the last few years and maybe even some videos, but I think an important side to this industry is recognising when you make a mistake. And so I'd like to speak about five, five mistakes which I've made in the watch industry and in the watch world, and which I've heard that other people have made too, because I think these are important points and certainly one should never take for granted the fact that the watch industry is a, is a safe place to enter, whether you're buying something um, or just learning about it. One always has to take time and recognise there are subtleties to it and aspects which you might not see at first. So today's episode is all about this um, and to give you a, an idea of the mistakes I've made and how I, I aim to not make them again and hopefully avoid other people making them too. So stay tuned for all of that. This week's episode is sponsored by Orage, the maker of unique watches for those who relish detail and innovation at a sensible price. Before I begin though, remember to like, share and subscribe and also head over to our Instagram page to see all the latest in terms of photos, videos and updates in terms of podcasts and articles as well. On that note, do head over to watchchronicle.com to be able to see full articles about new releases varying from everything from vintage pieces to interesting stories about the watch industry to special events being put on by Watch Chronicler. Now today's podcast is one which I've wanted to produce since I started producing these podcasts a few months ago. In terms of the way we, we live in the watch industry, and certainly from my position as someone who works full time in this industry, it's sometimes easy to get, get lost in the, the way things work without really thinking about things and stepping back. And so today I really would like to speak about five um, stumbles I've made during my time in the industry, and one which I know that other people have at times made too. And these are mistakes, buying watches, mistakes in terms of my assumptions about the industry, and also mistakes in terms of, of just understanding how I, I interact with watches and the way we all interact with watches as something fundamentally non-essential, but something which we're all very enthusiastic about and something which we all love, whether it's the design, the engineering, the history, whatever it might be. And the first thing I'd like to speak about is assuming that a watch is the sum of its specifications. And this is something I was very much guilty of in my early days of watch collecting, in my early days of producing videos, in my early days about uh, when I learned about watches, because it's very easy to look at a specifications sheet um, which is something, incidentally, which is often seen um, on things like forums or simply when people are having a discussion about watches. They compare specifications immediately, and there's so much more at play than just that. Now, if we look purely at the movement side of these things, which is the easiest aspect of a watch to quantify in terms of numbers and figures and details and play essentially a game of top trumps between two watches, even if they're not really comparable, and the example I have is the Seagull ST19 uh, column wheel chronograph movement in the Alpha Daytona I have. Now I bought the Alpha Daytona a few years ago now, I think four years ago um, at this point, and when I bought it I was intrigued to try out something new. Now firstly it was an homage, um, which is something I'm also speaking about in this, in this podcast, um, it was an homage to the, the uh, Rolex Daytona, uh, to the original Velgeru 72 powered uh, manually wound model. Um, before the, the Zenith movements and then the in-house movements in recent years. And I stand by the fact that it's a lovely looking watch. Uh, they're Chinese made, um, and that doesn't mean poor quality, um, as is something I also brush on in this podcast. Um, however, the movement they use is the Seagull ST19. Now, it's a remake of one of the, the Venus movements um, used across the Swiss watch industry in the mid-century. And these are manually wound, column wheel actuated, um, horizontal clutch chronographs. And if you were to put this in terms of um, pure, uh, as a pure game of top trumps beside, say, a Velgeru 7750 in, um, in a well-made, we won't give it a name, well-made Swiss watch, let's say, of a reasonable, um, respectable sort of price um, for that movement to be well-prepared and uh, well-regulated. The Seagull has a column wheel, which um, should mean um, smoother actuation to the chronograph. It shouldn't mean as much stutter. Um, in terms of the start and stop of the chronograph. However, with the Seagull movement I had, the quality control just wasn't there. Um, gears were slipping past each other, the column wheel itself wasn't working correctly, um, so you ended up having a situation where sometimes the second hand would jump backwards to before the 12 o'clock marker when you started the chronograph, um, which would then push the, um, the minute counter on the chronograph forwards by a minute. So it really was a mess, and I mean, what could I expect for a £150 watch? But at the same time, you do have to, to recognise that 
a Velger 7750 or indeed um, say a 7733 which is a, a variant, an earlier variant seen in all of mid-century chronographs um, which has the, the cam actuated chronograph instead of a column wheel, still a lateral clutch and is a fairly agricultural design. That's still a movement which um, if prepared really well will outperform the Seagull, will outperform that Venus movement. And so really it's not so much a case of comparing movements in terms of the features they have, but it's comparing quality. Um, because quality speaks volumes to the features the movement actually has. Um, and we do see this with some um, in-house movements which haven't been developed sufficiently in recent years, um, which have, have had teething problems even though on paper they're superior movements to a very standard um, uh, Swiss, Swiss piece. And this also brings me to another aspect of the same point, which is that if we take the ETA 2824, the industry standard for a Swiss automatic movement, one ETA 2824 is not like another ETA 2824. How these movements are sourced, whether they're movements which uh, have been sitting around for a long time before being used, or whether they're straight off the production line, how the brand chooses to, to go for specifications, and this goes into far more detail um, than just chronometer grade, uh, élaboré grade, standard grade, top grade. It actually varies much more than that in terms of features which they can choose um, and so on. So in reality, it really does come down to how a brand treats a movement as opposed to what that movement has in it. Now, of course, there are some inherent design flaws, like, for example, the ETA 284 has a fairly chronic problem with its reversers um, for automatic winding. Um, which means these do tend to wear out if you manually wind the watch very often. Um, you don't see this in, in, in the vast majority of them, but it's a known problem. Um, of course, that's the same across the board, but in general, the quality makes, it makes a real difference. But moving away from movements, something else which I uh, didn't appreciate when I first entered into the world of watches was the amount of money which goes into things other than the pure specifications. This is to say the care taken with the case finishing with the, the bits you can't see, like the movement mounts, the quality of the dial in terms of how it's mounted on the movement and within the case as a whole. And these are the kinds of aspects of a watch which will make a watch a pleasure to wear for years to come in terms of being good quality and reliable um, and well made. Um, if you have an imbalance in the quality of different parts within a watch, then the result is going to be a bit peculiar. So having good quality all around and good design, which is expensive too, so, frankly, what you're paying for very often when something on paper isn't terribly good value, but nonetheless you can appreciate the quality of, is quite often the fact that the manufacturer has taken an awful lot of care in terms of sourcing the parts, um, which is, of course, something which I didn't appreciate in my early years. The second pitfall which you can fall into, which I'd like to point out in today's podcast, is buying a substitute for a watch you want to buy further away in the future. Now, as watch lovers, we all have dreams and goals in the watch world, whether it's to have a collection of a certain type of watch or to get one particularly interesting piece, whether that's something in the high horology realms like a, a Langer, a particularly complicated Langer, or whether it's to go for something rarer or even a, a Rolex model which you can't get hold of immediately and you're on the waiting list for. And one thing which I would dissuade you from doing is buying a substitute in the meantime. Now, this can be an homage, or it can just be a more affordable, more easily acquired watch, which fits into the same kind of slot in your collection. And the reason why I dissuade this kind of practice is because it tends to result in much more money being spent. Now, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't go for a more affordable or more accessible watch if you find that that's a better option, because there have been times for me where I've looked at the more expensive model and end up going for something more affordable because I couldn't see the justification to the price for my applications and for my, my purposes. But it is important to consider this. In my own situation, it was buying an Oris Aquis um, a, uh, a few years ago before I bought my Seamaster. Um, I was contemplating having a, a more premium ceramic bezeled uh, dive watch in my collection, 300 meter dive watch. Um, and I ended up gravitating towards the Oris Aquis. This was the previous generation as opposed to the one now with the sharper hands. This was the earlier one um, with the rather lovely leaf hands. Um, and it was a fantastic watch, but it just wasn't the watch for me. Um, I'd bought it because it was more accessible, more affordable um, than the Seamaster in the short term. Um, and I never really clicked with it because it, 
ultimately wasn't actually the watch I was really after. And which was a shame because I think it spoilt the experience of owning an Aquis um, for some, to some extent. Because really a watch should be enjoyed for its own, uh, its own marvellous design, its own um, engineering, its own beauty. Um, as opposed to just being a, a stopgap um, before buying something later. Uh, and so it was, I was very quick to sell it. Um, which shows the fact that actually you end up spending more money with this approach because buying and selling watches, unless you're going for something rare or something especially desirable, does tend to result in the loss of some money. Um, whether it's because of a, a PayPal um, expense, if you're selling something through eBay, or just because you can't get the same amount of money for something, you can't really rely upon being able to sell something like that. Um, so if you're not sure about a purchase, I urge you to, uh, to wait and, uh, and at least be sure that you don't want the more expensive option or the, the long-term option before you choose to go for something in between. Often regarded as an inaccessible feature offered only by the most prestigious and historic of brands, the tourbillon is a mechanism designed to rotate the escapement of a watch, thus accounting for gravity. Whilst functionally curious, the view of this complication has fascinated watch lovers for years Yet today we see a change of tack for this feature. Arash has conceived a Swiss-made tourbillon available for an entirely unprecedented price under 7,000 francs. Produced with an emphasis on precision, accuracy and quality, these movements are conceived to balance Swiss tradition with absolute modernity at half the price of the nearest contender. Designed to advance this complication, Arash have created a unique aesthetic supported with quality. Having visited Arash's facilities in Biel, Switzerland, I can speak for the quality and the care with which these movements are designed for everyday life. In this way, the Tourbillon 1 from Arage represents the exceptional made accessible and the Tourbillon taken from the atelier to the laboratory. Learn more at arage.com. The third error which I've made was following market trends. And there's no problem with following trends, especially in the Instagram age, um, where we're presented with one model or a couple of models and our media um, uh, inlet, so to speak, in terms of what we, we, we see, what we, what we see around us, um, is saturated with certain models, as is the case with steel Rolexes at the moment, um, but which can be anything, depending upon which time of history. Um, it, it can be an error to follow this too closely. Now, in my case, for example, I, a few years ago I had a particular desire to buy a Tudor. I liked the way the brand was going. I, I'm not particularly taken by them these days, but they do make some great watches. And I particularly wanted to buy myself a uh, Black Bay 36. Um, it was the perfect sort of everyday watch I was after, um, and it fitted in with what I wanted extremely well. Now I went to the, the dealer um, nearby, the closest dealer, um, and I, I asked after the Black Bay 36, but they said that it would be over a three month waiting list um, with the assumption that it would be significantly more than that. Um, now at the time I wasn't um, particularly keen to wait that long um, but I was prepared to do so until I was presented with the Heritage Ranger. And I, I bought the watch um, and, and enjoyed it, in fact. It was a great watch. But it wasn't quite the watch I'd planned to fit into my collection, so to speak. Um, it wasn't quite the watch which I'd sort of organised myself around. I organised myself around having a Black Bay 36 in the collection. And so when push came to shove and, and I needed to sell a watch, that was the watch which went. And... I think this kind of situation shows that following a brand or a particular image without actually having a particular connection to the watch can be an error in terms of the long term. Now there are of course other aspects to this which are potentially more, more problematic than simply selling a, a relatively affordable Tudor in the grand scheme of things. And this is the fact that market interests change enormously. The fact is that um, people give the argument that, uh, well, certain watches like, let's say, the AP, the Udmapi Royal Oak, was a historically important watch, so it will always be important. Well, it's historically important, of course, and it did change the way people looked at watch design, but how many watches out there haven't hit the, hit the headlines, which also had a significant impact on the watch world? I suspect there are many. In fact, there are many which I can think of, which... Um, don't appear in terms of people's um, buying um, in people's sort of buying sites, despite their impact on the watch industry. So I think this that kind of um, reasoning doesn't necessarily give you a a good cause to spend large inflated sums of money very often on a watch, because the truth is that watches um, 
watches are unpredictable. Some watches go up, some watches go down. So buying what you want really um, it makes an awful lot of sense. It means that you'll be satisfied with what you have. It means that you'll, you'll enjoy it more um, without any sort of, uh, sort of regrets in the future, whether it's a market change or, or just a change of heart. The penultimate piece of advice which I want to give on the basis uh, that I've made this error before is that buying watches isn't a science and shouldn't be viewed as a means to an end. What I mean by this is that if you buy a watch, especially used, um, this especially applies to buying a used watch or one which isn't from an authorised dealer, um, is that the experience, the process of buying a watch should be enjoyable in its, in its own right. Um, you should be able to take your time, consider something uh, carefully and, 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 and back away from something if, it's not, if it doesn't feel right. Um, and this is incredibly important because there, it's very, very easy to make an error, especially with sellers um, who are uh, allegedly reputable. Now, I'm not going to mention any names, and actually I'm not going to go, um, go there with the, the scandal which took place a little while ago, because I think that's a slightly different situation. But what I mean is that um, very often someone can have good reviews, can be reputable, can be a successful seller of watches, but your experience with them falls short. And this is, it's always a shame when it happens, but it does show that if you are given any hint that there is a problem, caution should always be, be present in the purchase of a watch. Um, it shouldn't be something you rush to get the watch as a final result. It should be something which you work your way through as part of the, uh, the process of getting a watch. And to give you sort of a, a, a certain context, I'll use my Chrono Swiss as an example. I bought my Chrono Swiss from quite a, quite a reputable um, uh, seller of, of uh, used watches in Germany. Now, they're a very, very large seller. You see uh, an enormous number of watches going through that company. And I knew of people who'd previously bought from them. And I'm not going to mention the name of the company, but um, if you look around, you'll likely be able to find who they are based upon the, the Chrono Swiss I bought. And I'd seen some reviews which were slightly questioning the, the care taken with these watches. And I, I disregarded them and I bought the watch. And I have no regrets over that watch because I was very lucky. Um, I was treated very courteously and very, uh, very well by Chrono Swiss about the situation. But I experienced several problems with the watch, including a pusher which came off, um, a seal which was uh, reversed inside the watch, and a few things which needed to be tweaked. Um, but there was some damage to the case as well as a result of forced um, screws on the, the screw bars. And these kinds of um, aspects, which weren't quoted to me, weren't mentioned to me, and ultimately it was more complicated to get the watch, um, to send the watch back, than simply have the work conducted um, and, and sorted out. And so it's this kind of situation where I, I regret not uh, being more vigilant, more careful, and taking my time more. Because buying watches isn't a science. Um, it's likely that we all will, will stumble through problems um, from time to time. And it's very rare to come across a watch which is, um, which is very rare or valuable, especially. So if ever you're presented with that too, it's always important to, to approach these things with caution and with, uh, with, with a certain reluctance to buy until absolutely, absolutely convinced. And I think this is much like buying a car. If you buy a car used, you don't simply drive it away from the, the, uh, the seller, you pay for a, a, a mechanic to check it over um, if, it's, if it's worth the money. And I think it's the same thing with a watch. Um, you can't approach these things with absolute trust unless you are going through a seller which is authorised by the brand or which you have, have it on good authority, know what they're doing. And that's something which one should always be careful of and, and is an important side to be aware of in the watch world. And this isn't all doom and gloom, but it's just something to be aware of to make the experience more enjoyable. The final error in this, in this, uh, this podcast is one which I think a lot of people um, come across in, in their early days of, um, uh, of, of enjoying watches but which, as a result of, of certain um, parts of the industry, parts of the watch community, can settle into someone's understanding of watches, which isn't necessarily true, is the assumption that brands you've heard of are larger or, or at least different um, to what you expected. Now, because of the way modern media works, um, even small micro-brands get significant um, publicity. Uh, by comparison to in the past when only larger brands with significant advertising budget were able to get this kind of media attention. 
Modern media has also placed these smaller brands on the same um, table, so to speak, as much larger brands. So brands which will sell, say, um, will have a turnover, an annual turnover of over a billion francs a year, will be put in the same category because they operate in the same price range as one which sells maybe a tenth of that, possibly significantly less. And this creates an interesting sort of imbalance in people's expectations. And this is an interesting one because I think that as watch enthusiasts, we often think that we're a larger part of the watch buying market than we, than we actually are. Um, the fact is that as a, um, an enthusiast, we represent an infinitesimally small part of the, the, this, the gross sales of, of most brands. Um, and if a brand, if we want to expect a brand to cater to us in terms of um, the features we want, the designs we want, which aren't necessarily what the wider market wants, we have to accept that this is expensive. Because like anything, putting aside the average consumer who's much more numerous um, costs a brand and thus the buyer. So either a brand has large facilities and lots of employees to produce many watches for many people, or few employees, a narrow range, and either long waiting lists um, because of the, the few people working for them, and or high prices to justify the, the small numbers they're selling. So in reality, it's, it's only micro brands which operate with very, very low overheads, which are able to give us um, which are able to give us the enthusiast sort of grade watches we want for an affordable price at the cost of numbers. The fact is you'll have to wait for these because manufacturing um, doesn't happen overnight. It's something which, which takes time. So these are all aspects which, which come into play when you consider brands. And then there is also the aspect which is that um, there are misunderstandings with brands. Um, I don't think forums in the watch industry have necessarily helped this, um, and I, I might produce a uh, podcast specifically about the watch forums because I think it's a very interesting side to the industry. So tell me in the comments down below if you'd like to hear a podcast about that. But I think in some ways they've had a, a somewhat negative um, impact because I think a lot of gossip takes place or a lot of um, speculation takes place which over time becomes fact because of how many times it's repeated. An example which I'd give is is the situation with Squale a few years ago, where um, they had some very vague statements on their site about their history, which um, were misconstrued, unfortunately, by people um, because of poor translations um, and and vague information as the fact they were trying to hide their history, when the reality is they just weren't attuned to the way the modern world and modern media functioned. Um, and so it's imbalances like this which can cause misunderstandings and, and confusion for someone. Confusion which I myself have, um, uh, have fallen for and, and it's taken speaking to someone within the industry uh, and many people within the industry to really appreciate how much I'd misunderstood. And so there were five general themes which I think are, are, are easily misunderstood and would be errors to, to believe and to, to misunderstand entering the watch industry or just as someone who enjoys watches. And as I've said, these are all errors which I've made, whether there are an error of understanding, an error purchasing something, or undertaking a direction with watch collecting which hasn't been to my, to my benefit. So I hope you enjoyed this podcast, and tell me what you thought in the comments down below. These podcasts are now available on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify, as well as um, via the watchchronicle.com website, where you can listen to all these podcasts. And so I hope you enjoyed this, and do tell me what you'd like to see next. So thank you very much for listening. This is Armand from watchchronicle.com. Out.